Uh, welcome to the Potter's House and uh, this live presentation that you can come back and look at in the archives later if you would like. Um, discussing the latest trends um, in the, uh, I guess, institutional church or church period, if you want to call that, at least today we are. And uh, I was prompted to um, discuss this via some emails I've, I've gotten and um, other things. And so it has also prompted me to kind of make everybody privy to a new direction that we've kind of gone in our ministry. So, um, as you know uh, from uh, the blog, what we are discussing is James McDonald and the Harvest Bible uh, Chapel. And we have a history with Harvest Bible Chapel, which is James Mac, uh, McDonald's. It seems even strange to refer to a ministry that size uh, via or identify it with a man, okay? But that's the reality of which we live in today, right? And um, uh, irregardless of what Paul said about ministries um, or gospels or beliefs identified with men, all right? Um, you know, probably a false gospel uh, at most and spiritual immaturity at least, but anyway, this is this is where we are. So we go back a lot of years with the whole James McDonald and Harvest Bible Chapel fiasco. James McDonald um, is what we would probably refer to as a new Calvinist and amongst the new Calvinist, which by the way, the the term New Calvinist is, um, I talk to a lot of Christians who've never even heard of the term or the movement, which is amazing, because um, New Calvinism, which is Old Calvinism, which is a return to authentic Protestant orthodoxy, we've gone all, uh, into all of this uh, many times before, uh, owns at least 90% of the present-day evangelical church. It's just that the movement remains incredibly covert, and a lot of people, um, even though uh, they uh, have never heard of the term of the movement, New Calvinist, their churches definitely function according to that doctrine. And, the, and as we've discussed before, the reason that um, authentic, the authentic Protestant uh, gospel of New Calvinism is, is overcome the evangelical church like a wildfire is because basically the evangelical church was already primed for authentic uh, Protestantism and what that is. And um, so, um, early on, a little bit of history here, and I want to keep this to about a half an hour, so we got to get going. So, and then we have another live um, presentation, mm, I believe at uh, 1.30, okay? So... When I first heard of James McDonald, and he had a radio program. I forget the name of the, the uh, radio program. But that was during a time in Susan and I's life when we were still looking for um, a good church, okay? Or a church that was it partaking in all of the nonsense and um, even better yet if possible a church that would stand up to the nonsense okay so we were still in that stage holding out hope 
And lo, here comes uh, James McDonald. Uh, this would have been back 2011 or so. So you're talking, you know, Tank Ministries had been going on for some time, for a couple of years. And, uh, but you know, uh, our ministry has, has grown, I would say, over the years as we gain more understanding. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is our present position on church is different from what it was then in 2011, okay? So uh, we're, still, uh, we're still holding out hope, okay? And we're, we're church hunting and so on and so forth. And one day Susan calls me up and says, Turn on your radio, turn on your radio, you got to listen to this guy. So in the beginning, we thought he was great, all right? And he really seemed to be great in the beginning. And um, I think perhaps maybe he was because um, it's very possible that in 2011, James McDonald wasn't a new Calvinist, okay? I think he had a historical grammatical view of the Bible, all right, and um, I think uh, his preaching was definitely along the lines of practical application of the scriptures, okay, and I think like John, what, what happened to John MacArthur in 1994, uh, he's like kind of converted into this new movement, and I think that the movement so took over the evangelical uh, churches that um, I think a lot of these guys had no choice but to be drawn into this uh, back into authentic Protestantism or else be, um, you know, uh, pushed into obscurity um, and, you know, perhaps even losing of their ministries. So I was fine with him in the beginning, then things started really getting whopper jawed not too long after. Um, you know, a matter of two or three months later, and this was in 2011, I think that's when James McDonald was first invited to these Together for the Gospel and the Gospel Coalition conferences. All right, so he got involved there. And I remember how disappointed Susan and I were that he was, you know, a speaker at that Together for the Gospel conference. Well, things really start getting, like I said, uh, whopper jawed after that, or whacker jawed, or whatever it is. And um, I ended up writing. Um, something like 20 posts. So like if you go into Paul's Passing Thoughts and go to the side panel there and do a uh, search, search for articles, if you write in James McDonald and hit that, you're going to see many, many articles we wrote on all of the drama that's been going on there since 2011, which has been incessant. So. Um, what I want to focus on today, though, is not just James McDonald and Harvest ba Bible Chapel uh, in, in particular, but how it really speaks to the condition of the evangelical church and church period in general. So we have, on our ministry, we have these... Um, stat tracker software and ways of knowing not who's coming to our blog, um, who they are, but where they're located. All right. As you know, the lion's share of the Harvest Bible Chapel campuses, which, you know, all of New Calvinism is into this campus construct, where you've got a central eldership or central control of a ministry 
and they're like these several churches or campuses okay and um, so most of the uh, Harvest Bible Chapel campuses are around the Chicago area there and um, within all oh, I don't know 50 square miles or so something like that I don't know or less and there used to be I guess last I heard there's like nine campuses in that general area outside of Chicago so here's what happened since 2011 we'll go to our stats and of course just let me put it this way Harvest Bible Chapel has been the focus of controversy for years since 2011 how many years are we talking about seven eight years okay just incessant ongoing drama okay one controversy after another so we'll go to the stats and this has been for years now we'll go to the stats Andy or I and it's like all of these massive hits from the Chicago area and surrounding you know just like hundreds of hits from that general area and our response is alright what's going on at Harvest ba uh, Bible Chapel this time so we'll go to Google type in James McDonald and voila the latest drama and that's what happened here uh, of late so what's the latest drama so you know I just I don't go to stats often but I did and when I went to stats here's all these red dots around Chicago so I'm like oh brother here we go again what is it this time and so I googled it and voila it's um, Harvest Bible Chap Chapel fires Florida pastor for not wanting James McDonald to preach during his indefinite uh, sabbatical and uh, you know I just love looking at the guy's picture you know with the black leather jacket and the skin head and the glasses and the whole thing because why do I like looking at that picture because I would like to think when I was still going to church that I would walk in and see that and be like whoa you know red flags but anyway that's just me um, so at any rate um, I was not aware that they had a campus down in Florida okay and so this is a drama within a drama and as what goes on with Bible Harvest Church and really a lot of these New Calvinist Church um, it starts with a drama and in every case the elders handle the situation so poorly that it'll spawn two or three more dramas I mean it's just the gift that just keeps on giving right so um, at any rate um, to become part of the Bible Harvest or Harvest Bible Chapel family okay you incorporate into their corporation that's these various and sundry, sundry um, campuses and basically what you've done you and your members you've you've um, uh, come into this business agreement you know with um, these other churches or a central church authority okay now you go to churches week in and week out and you you hear family this family that blah 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 uh, these are businesses in fact uh, we've done some learning over the years when you sign a church covenant alright and covenant is a soft term at least in this case for contract 
you've entered into a contract with that church, okay? Um, and at that point, you have no recourse, all right? They can slander you, they can, well, I don't want to go too far with this, but at least in regard to slander, you have no recourse. You have no legal recourse. Because it's all going to be in this covenant. Okay? And um, so it becomes very authoritative. All right? So this church down in Florida, I know, hasn't been part of their network for very long. Okay? But what this church was thinking when the drama that's been going on uh, with Harvest Bible Chapel, Chapel has just been incessant and ongoing. What they were thinking, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was a small uh, a church that got into financial trouble and needed, I don't know, all right? But what happened was, Per the usual, some kind of drama got going uh, with Harvest Bible Chapel. Uh, and I do believe whatever that drama was, was spawned by the drama, was spawned by the drama um, in regard to some blogger, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, a Harvest Bible Chapel sued a blogger. Okay? Sued a blogger. The blogger, and I forget her name, another discernment blogger out to save the church, and we're going to talk about that. This discernment blogger countersued, and a bunch of stuff was going to become public, so the Harvest Bible Chapel elders withdrew uh, the suit, okay? Very much the same uh, with my situation at Clear Creek Chapel where I continually got emails from people, Paul, Paul, you've got to back up. Dude, they are going to sue you. And in fact, they did send me a letter of intent threatening to sue me, okay? Uh, I think giving me 48 hours to retract this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. But uh, they did send me an email of in intent to sue, okay? Um, and I never backed off. I was never afraid. But I'll tell you how intense it was from somebody standing outside and hadn't quite learned what I had learned at this point. It was very s scary. My wife, Susan, was like begging me to back off. She's like, man, these people have money. We're going to get sued. Why didn't I ever back off? Because I knew they couldn't afford to have all of their dirty laundry drug out in court. Like the fact that they were literally holding me hostage there for like four months, okay? Uh, you can't leave the membership, you gotta stay here and submit to our authority or we'll ruin you, okay? Um, and that's a whole nother story I'm not gonna get into. But I never backed down, why didn't I back down? Because like all of these churches, they absolutely cannot afford to have all of their dirty laundry drug out in court, and I knew that. So I was never worried about it. However, there was a part of me that, um, uh, there was a part of me that kind of said, um, you know, I'd like to see all this stuff become public, okay? So then, here we are. Um, this guy in Florida, um, you've got two dramas going on that I know of that leads to James McDonald uh, going on an indefinite sabbatical, okay? But also in the letter sent out by the elders, it's, it's um, 
it's revealed that he'll be preaching in some of the camp campuses from time to time. So all of this pastor of this church campus, uh, Harvest Bible Chapel church campus down in Florida does, all he does is send a letter to the elders saying, I think that's a bad idea. So what do they do? They fire him. How do you like that for family involvement? Okay, we're just all happy. Like right here at the Potter's house, we have quite a bit of uh, family here. You know, if my mother does something that I agree with, well, I think I'll just go in and fire her. How's that? Okay. Um, so, at any rate, the whole thing about churches being God's family, joke. Okay. Now, friends, what's going on? We got like nine minutes, so this is the crux of this whole thing, short and sweet. Take note. For years, these parishioners at Harvest Bible Chapel have been coming to our ministry to do research and get answers, but ultimately they won't do the nuclear option. Okay? Why? And remember the, our beliefs. There's a why for everything. There's always a why. Um, ideology is driven by logic, or actions are driven by ideology or logic. Um, you know, uh, what's the logic behind a criminal doing something really, really stupid? Well, his logic is is that he can get away with it. Okay? Um, at any rate, what is the logic that keeps these people coming to us for uh, and researching our stuff for answers, but obviously are not leaving that church or doing anything different? Okay, well, they're merely using our research to try to fix the church. Okay, and we have come to our place in, a minister, in our ministry to presently, we now understand that that's what's going on. Okay, we have a lot of people involved in our ministry who know what we are saying is truth. Well, I mean, we research it and, you know, have endless citations on everything. So, basically, however, rather than a solution, they're trying to fix the church. Well, the church isn't fixable. Okay? The church isn't fixable. And you can tune back in back at 1.30 when we talk about dispensationalisms and its stuff, and we're going to kind of get in there uh, to why the church isn't fixable, okay? First of all, um, as Andy and I write in the book and document in the book, um, the church doesn't even come along till the fourth century. Before that, uh, by and large, Christ's assembly, okay, Christ's ecclesia, does function 100% like a family. And that's hard for us to get our minds around, but if you read through the New Testament with that prism, with a family prism, because that's what it was, that's what you're going to begin to see, not the institutional mindset. And by the way, you can't separate church and institution. Church began as an institution. By nature, it's an institution. Okay? So, here's what we're going to start doing. Um, this is a high watermark of our uh, ministry, a demarcation point in our ministry. The church lie and the biblical alternative. Okay? Um, 
we understand it's very difficult for people in our culture to get their mind around the fact that there is an alternative to church. That church doesn't have to be fixed because it was alive from the beginning and there is a true biblical alternative. Okay? So the new church policy is is that when people contact us, which they do often, and say, we want to talk about what's going on in our church, and I've got this meeting with an elder or elders, okay, and I want to get your input before I go into this meeting. No. Every time we're going to hand you this book, okay, every time we're going to hand you this book. And the reason that we're going to do that is that we understand now that, and we're flattered that people want to pick our brains, and we're flattered that people think that um, we've got something to bring to the table about why the things that are going on in the church are going on, okay, and we're flattered by that, but we also understand uh, the motives behind tapping into our resources are misguided because it's an endeavor to save the church and the, the church can't be saved. Okay? Um, no amount of discernment blogs um, or begging or praying, pleading, uh, offering up your children as sacrifices, offering up your marriage as a sacrifice, nothing's going to fix the church. Okay? So, basically, that's what we're going to be doing, and in fact, Susan and I have already started doing it, um, especially people who want to come to us f with marriage counseling. Um, you read this, and then we'll sit down. Okay? Um, with that, what else do I want to add? Okay? Um... It looks like I got about two minutes of live streaming left. So basically, what we do in this book on page 12, there's the chapter theses. And basically, what this book does is it takes 10 assumptions about church. Um, it takes 10 assumptions about church. They're better maybe stated on the back. Um, let me see here. That, let's take the assumption that the present day church is connected historically to the book Acts. There's not a Christian on the face of the earth, okay, that would not agree with that. We totally debunk that in the book. Um, we, let me see, what is another assumption? Um, let me see. Um, mm, ten major presuppositions that define the church. Um, the church is the assembly of Christ. We totally debunk that. <clears throat> the church is the body of Christ. We spend a whole chapter debunking that. Uh, especially the assumption that the church is a light for God in this dark world. Okay? We spend a whole chapter debunking that. That the church is the love of God. Doctrinally,